<clears throat> well, good morning, and uh, I want to say thank you, uh, Graham, for the uh, privilege and opportunity to come back and be part of this. And I just want to, uh, well, I can't believe it's uh, Friday already, and uh, it is going to be difficult to, uh, to leave. I want to thank you uh, for the privilege that you've given me to be part of your lives this week. If you'd like to stay in touch, if you're online, uh, these are ways to find me, uh, pretty easy, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter. Uh, I don't do Snapchat. Old people shouldn't do Snapchat, but old people are starting to do Snapchat, so, but I will not for now. So, uh, those are ways. If, if you're not on any of those things, shoot me an email, but I truly would love to hear from you during the year. Let me know what's going on in your life, how I could pray for you, how I can encourage you. Uh, I really love hearing from you. I uh, also want to remind you, uh, especially if you're leaving, uh, to take time to thank your faculty, your counselors, and the staff here at Chehi, because they all come here for one reason, and that's because they love you, they care about you, and they deeply want to invest in your lives. So make sure that you take time to let them know that you appreciate their ministry and their teaching and the impact they've had in your life. I've heard it said that if hurts were hairs, we'd all be bears. If hurts were, that, that for every time that you experienced a hurt in a life, a new hair grew on your body, right? That, that without much time passing, pretty soon we'd all be pretty hairy, right? We, we'd be pretty hairy creatures. You know, hurt is something that we cannot avoid in life. Hurt is something we cannot avoid in life. And all of us, all of us, no matter what our stories are, no matter what our background is, no matter what our journey has been, all of us, all of us have experienced hurt. All of us have experienced injustice. All of us have wrestled with things that have happened to us that should not have happened to us. And maybe you're there this morning, and as we wrap up our journey with Joseph, as we continue to look at the family reunion that takes place, and today looking at it through Joseph's eyes and through Joseph's perspective, I want us to see what God might have for us in his word that might help us to figure out how we should handle our hurt, and our herders. And if anybody could identify with hurt, it was Joseph, wasn't it? I mean, think about his story. He was sold by his brothers into slavery. He was falsely accused by his master Potiphar's wife, and he was thrown into prison. And then he was forgotten, right? I mean, his journey has been difficult. And if anybody knew about hurt, it was Joseph. Joseph knew what it was like to be hurt. And as we began to look at yesterday, in the most sort of bizarre of circumstances, Joseph has a reunion that he may never have expected with his brothers. And listen, Joseph is in perfect position for what? Revenge. Revenge. Payback. Right? I mean, if anybody was in position for payback, it was Joseph. Right? He's the second most powerful man in the world. And so he's in a perfect position to pay his brothers back for what they've done. And we could understand if he did, couldn't we? Right, because payback is the natural response when we experience injustice. When we're hurt, we want to hurt back. That's just our natural response. But I want you to see that Joseph doesn't do what was logical, but instead he's going to put his brothers through a series of tests. And, you know, on the surface, it almost looks like he's just messing with them, right? Like, he's just kind of toying with them a little bit. But we're going to see as we go through the, the narrative that, that it's something far deeper than just messing with them. He's examining their hearts. And not only is he examining their hearts, but his actions are actually bringing them to a place where they are ready to experience the forgiveness and the grace that he is going to offer them. So let's pick up this morning in Genesis 43 and verse 15. And where we are is that uh, Jacob is sending his sons back to Egypt for grain the second time. And reluctantly, he's sending Benjamin with them, right? Because Simeon is in prison and, and Joseph had told them, if you don't come back with your younger brother, you'll never see your other brother again and you won't be able to get any grain. But if you bring him back, you can trade and, and we can do business. So in, in these verses, we'll find out that, that they s travel back down to Egypt. And so in verse 17... Uh, well, let's, let's go to verse 16. They, they've arrived in Egypt, and it says, When Joseph saw Benjamin with them, he said to the manager of his household, These men will eat with me this noon. Take them inside the palace, then go and slaughter an animal and prepare a big feast. So the man did as Joseph told him and took them into Joseph's palace. 
And the brothers were terrified when they saw that they were be ta being taken into Joseph's house. It's because of the money someone put in our sacks last time that we are here. He, is, he plans to pretend that we stole it, and then he will seize us, make us slaves, and take our donkeys. And so they, they come back to Egypt, and they go before Joseph, and Joseph sees them, and he says, I, I want you to have these men come to the palace for lunch today and, and go get a cow and make a really nice meal, all right? And, and yet Joseph's brothers are terrified, right? Because their guilt, remember we talked about yesterday? Their guilt is still hanging over them so heavily that they can't see what God is doing. And they don't see that they're receiving favorable treatment. Instead of saying, wow, no one else that came to get grain today got to eat lunch at Joseph's house, right? No one else got an invitation for, for fatted calf, you know? Are you with me? But they couldn't see the blessing because they were guilty. In fact, they were so fearful that, that what they did to Joseph, selling him into slavery, was going to happen to them. And then they were worried about their donkeys, too, which is kind of interesting. <laughs> He's going to take our donkeys. I mean, I'm sure that was their mode of transportation. So think of it as like, he's going to take our car. Fear makes you irrational. Fear makes you paranoid. And what's really interesting is that God is going to give them a theological lesson from, one of, from an Egyptian servant. Look, look, look in the text. Look at verse 23. They, they are really, really, they're trying to smooth things over with the, this servant Right? And they're like, they're like we, we didn't take the money. We, we didn't do it. You know, you know, it's all a mistake and we'll, we'll pay it back. And this is what he says. He says, relax. He's like, you guys are stressed. You, know, you, you, need, to, you need to chill out. You guys look terrible. He says, don't be afraid. The household manager told them. Your God. He goes, you know, the God you claim to serve. The God of your father. He must have put this treasure into your sacks. I know, you I know I received your payment. And then he released Simeon and brought him out to them. And so we see this situation. They've been reunited with Simeon. Pharaoh's servant gives them a theological lesson. He's like, he's like, God's at work in your lives, guys. Don't you see it? Don't you see how God's at work? But they, they didn't see it yet. Well, as we move through Genesis 43... Uh, they are waiting for Joseph. They are they're at his house, and, and Joseph finally arrives around lunchtime, and they're getting ready to have the meal. And, and this is what we see take place. It says in verse 26, When Joseph came home, they gave him the gifts that they had brought him, and they bowed low to the ground before him, once again, the dream being fulfilled. And after greeting them, he said, How's your father, the old man that you spoke about? Is he still alive? That was his daddy. And they said, yes, our father, your servant, is alive and well. And they bowed low again. And then Joseph looked at his brother Benjamin, the son of his own mother, his only true brother, his only full brother. He says, is this your youngest brother, the one you told me about? Joseph asked. May God be gracious to you, my son. Then Joseph hurried from the room because overcome with emotion for his brother. And he went into his private room and he broke down and wept. As we said yesterday, this was not easy for Joseph. All right, just because Joseph successfully navigates so many twists and turns in life and we see his faithfulness and we see God's hand on his life does not mean that it did not hurt deeply. And with deep emotion, he weeps. And it says, after washing his face, he came back out and keeping himself under control, he ordered, he says, bring out the food. And, and so his brothers are all seated at a table. He sits at a table. Some servants sit over at another table because Egyptians and Hebrews didn't eat together. But the crazy thing was, he seated them all in birth order. Right? All 11 of them were set in birth order. And I'm not a great math person and statistics go beyond, you know, my comprehension. Anybody else with me? All right. But statisticians will tell us that there are literally over a million different combinations of the way that you could have seated these 11 men. And so in order for them to be sat perfectly in their birth order was, was a great anomaly. And, and it surprised them. In fact, they said they were amazed. Look at verse 33. Joseph told his brothers where to sit, and to their amazement, he seated them according to age, from oldest to youngest. And he filled their plates with food from his own table, giving Benjamin five times as much as he gave the others. So, so you can just sort of picture that, right? And they all got a nice plate of food, and Benjamin's just got like this mountain of food. And they're like, wow. 
And then it says, finally, then they feasted and drank freely with him. And so twice in this passage, we see they bow before their brother. They, they are invited to this meal. Joseph is just continuing to see what's in their hearts. And so they have this meal. And then in Genesis 44, they go to leave. And, and Joseph gives them grain and, and he gives them provisions for their journey. But really, he's ready to reveal himself to them. But there's just one more thing he needs to know, one more test. And so what he does is that he sends them out and he takes his own silver cup, a very, very unique cup that was uniquely his, and he puts it in Benjamin's sack of grain. And then he sends them on their way. And then after a few minutes, he says to some of his servants, he's like, go track down my brothers. Someone stole my cup. So they go and they track down Joseph's brothers and, and they say, hey, hey guys, hold up. One of you stole uh, you know, the governor's cup. And they're like, no, 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 we didn't do that. In fact, they say this, they're like, you know what, if we did it, you can kill the person who, who took it and make all the rest of us your slaves. Right, because they were so caught, they knew they didn't steal it. So they start opening their, their sacks and lo and behold, whose sack is it in? Benjamin's. Well, what, it, what had Judah promised dad, right? He said, dad, I guarantee you, I promise we'll bring Benjamin back safely. In fact, I guarantee him with my own life. And listen, that's the same Judah, right, that 20 some plus years earlier was the one that's like, hey, let's sell Joseph. We won't feel guilty, right? Something's happened in Judah's life and we see a progression of development in Judah. And so Judah is actually going to go and and he's going to sort of argue with, with so they're taken back and, and Joseph sort of treats them very, very roughly. And he says, you know, didn't you think I'd find this out? And, and what were you thinking? And, 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 and they say, you know, we, we'll, we'll all be your slaves. And Joseph says, no, that's not necessary. Just the one who took the cup. Well, Judah realizes we can't go back without Benjamin. And so, so Judah steps forward and he begins to explain to, to Joseph and he says, listen, he's like my dad, he's an old man and, and he's experienced a lot of heartache because our other brother, you know, is torn to pieces and he kind of tells him the lie, you know, which Joseph's got everything. No, I wasn't. <laughs> and Judah says, look, look, you, it will kill our dad if you keep Benjamin, so keep me instead. Keep me instead. Keep me instead. Look at what he says. He says, please, Lord, let me stay here as a slave instead of the boy. And let the boy return with his brothers. For how can I return to my father if the boy is not with me? I couldn't bear to see the anguish on my father's face. And Joseph now realizes his brothers are ready for the reveal. His brothers are ready. His brothers are ready. Look at verse chapter 45. Joseph could stand it no longer, and there were many people in the room, and he said to his attendants, Out, all of you. So he was alone with his brothers when he told them who he was, and then he broke down and wept. Again, deep emotion. He wept so loudly the Egyptians could hear him, and word of it carried to Pharaoh's palace. And then check out verse 3. With great tears and great emotion, he says to his brothers, I am Joseph. In Hebrew. Can you imagine what they were feeling? Well, we don't have to. Look at what the text says. He says, I am Joseph. Is my father still alive? And it says his brothers were speechless and stunned. <laughs> yeah, you would have been too. They were stunned. To say that they were shocked would be the understatement of the universe. And look what he says in verse Verse 4, if you have your Bible open. In verse 4, he says, please come closer. And then he said to them, I am your brother Joseph, whom you sold into slavery in Egypt. But don't be upset. Don't be upset. And don't be angry with yourselves for selling me into this place. For it was God who sent me here ahead of you to preserve your lives. This famine has ravaged the land for two years and will last five more years and there will be neither plowing nor harvesting. And God has sent me ahead of you to keep you and your families alive and to preserve many survivors. So it was God who sent me here and not you. And he is the one who has made me an advisor to Pharaoh, the manager of his entire palace and the governor of all of Egypt. 
And so here is this incredibly intense scene in Scripture. And in this moment, Joseph is telling his brothers, I am not going to pay you back. In fact, I am going to forgive you. And in fact, I am going to provide for you. And we might need to step back for a moment and say, how could Joseph do this? How could he do this? I mean, how could Joseph forgive such great sin, such great evil? What enabled Joseph to forgive his brothers? I believe it was simply this, as we see in the text, Joseph was able to see the unseen hand of God at work in his life. Joseph was able to see the unseen hand of God at work in his life. He says, it was God who sent me here. It was God who's been at work in my life. And I am willing to forgive you. Now here's the thing. Forgiveness is not a denial of reality. Remember, he told his brothers. He says, you you sold me into slavery. And years later, when they're still struggling with guilt, after their dad dies, Joseph will say, you meant it for evil. Right? Forgiveness is not denying the pain. It's not denying the hurt. I mean, it was with great emotion and great tears that Joseph spoke these words. Forgiveness isn't saying that what happened to you didn't matter. It didn't, it's not saying that it didn't hurt. It's not saying that it wasn't wrong. Forgiveness is not a denial of truth or reality. It's a choice to see life from God's viewpoint and not yours only. Joseph said, you sold me into slavery. You meant it for evil. But Joseph saw that God was able to redeem his circumstances and take what was meant for evil, what was evil. Like, let's not gloss it over. It was evil what they did. But God is able to take even the evil things, even the injustices, even the hurts that we experience in life, the things that happen to you, the mistreatment that you receive, the hurt that we experience. God can take even the hurt and even the evil, and even the things that aren't right. And God can use them for good in ways that we could never imagine or never understand. And that's exactly what God did in Joseph's life. Hundreds of years later, hundreds, a descendant of Judah, old Judah, a descendant of Judah would be similarly mistreated, rejected by his family, unfairly treated, illegally arrested, illegally tried, mocked, abused, crucified on a cross. His name was Jesus. You see, God had plans for Joseph's family. And Jesus offers us, Jesus offers us what Joseph offered his brothers. Think about that. Jesus offers you what Joseph offered his brothers. What did Joseph offer his brothers? He offered them mercy. Mercy is is not getting what you deserve. Have you ever experienced mercy? You probably experienced it this week from your counselor, right? Mercy is is not getting what you deserve. And so that means if if you've done something that deserves punishment, like what Joseph's brothers did, right? right, Joseph's saying, I'm not going to punish you. I'm not going to pay you back. That's mercy. Right? If if one day, you know, some of you are starting to drive now, right? And many of you will be driving in the next few years. And, you know, if unfortunately there should come a moment where you see blue lights in your rearview mirror, right? And you pull over and, 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 and you're just thinking, I hope he's what? Merciful, right? Mercy would be not getting what you deserve. Hey, just going to give you a warning today. But, but not only did Joseph give his brothers mercy, but he also gave them grace. Because he didn't just say, you know what? I'm not, I'm not going to pay you back. Take some grain and go home. I don't need to see you anymore. I'm, I'm done with you. He said, no, you're going to move down here. Go get dad and bring him back. And I'm going to take care of you. And I'm going to provide for you. And you are going to live well here in the land of Egypt. He gave them not just what they are withholding of their punishment, but he gave them precisely what they did not deserve. He met their needs and took care of them. 
And that's exactly what God does for us because God does not just offer us mercy, right? He does not just say, I'll forgive your sin and I won't judge you and I won't punish you. He also says, I'm going to lavish my grace on you. I'm going to give you precisely what you do not deserve. I'm going to give you myself, my glory, my presence, my power. I'm going to give you myself. The hope of Christ that we have is that we have Christ in us now and for eternity. And he says, as we looked earlier, Luke chapter 12, verse 32, fear not, little flock. Why? For it's the Father's good pleasure to give you what? The kingdom. Right? God is giving you himself. He's giving you his kingdom, his glory. He's invited you to rule and to reign with him forever and ever and ever. That's grace. Right? He gives us mercy and grace. And as people who have experienced mercy and grace, if you know this mercy and grace of Jesus, and if you don't, I, won't, I don't want you to leave here without knowing that. Right? I don't want you to leave here without knowing that the God of the universe sent His Son into this world to live the life that you could not live. Right? He lived a perfect life, a sinless life. He died the death that you deserve to die, that I deserve to die. He rose from the dead three days later. He ascended to the Father where he rules at the right hand of God. He prays for you and he intercedes for you. And one day he's coming in power and in glory. And until that time, he invites men and women all over this world to come to him by faith and receive grace and forgiveness, to come into his kingdom. And so the invitation is clear for God so loved the world that whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. And if you've experienced that grace, and if you've experienced that mercy, then God calls us to make that our story and to live it out. Look at what Paul says in his letter to the Colossians. He says, make allowance for each other's faults and forgive anyone who offends you. Remember the Lord forgave you, so you must forgive others. It's not easy, is it? In fact, it's impossible in ourselves. But because of the grace of God and because of what God has done, he says, make allowance for each other's faults. Forgive anyone who offends you. Remember what? The Lord forgave you. God's given you mercy. He's given you grace. He says, now treat others the way God has treated you. Grace is our story. and We're called to live grace and to share grace. How do we do it? Well, we have to see the unseen hand of God in our life, don't we? We have to see that God is at work even in the injustice and even in the hurt and even in the pain. We have to see that just as God was with Joseph, he's with us. Right? God's promised us that he'll never leave us, he'll never abandon us, he'll never forsake us. And not only that, Jesus says, I know suffering, I know pain. Hebrews chapter 4 says that we have a high priest who is touched with our infirmities, with our weaknesses. So he's compassionate and gracious. And so God is with us and he walks through these things with us and he also empowers us to say, I'm with you, my hand is at work, my plans for you will be accomplished even in the pain and even in the injustice so you can trust me. And you can do what I've asked you to do which is to treat others the way you've treated me. We have to look at life vertically, not just horizontally. I want to give you three real, real quick tips about this. Number one, Three truths about forgiveness and grace. Number one, forgiveness and grace are the supernatural responses to injustice. Right? It's natural to want to pay back. It's natural to want to hurt back. Right? We all feel that, but God calls us to not go by our feelings or our natural tendencies, but to trust Him. Revenge is rooted in the belief that you and I can do a better job than God at payback. But listen, God can handle the situation far more perfectly than you could ever handle it. And so you can trust him. Listen, God did not miss what happened to you. Psalm 94 verse 9 says, Does he who fashioned the ear not hear? Does he who formed the eye not see? Does he who disciplines nations not punish? Does he who teaches mankind lack knowledge? God did not miss what happened to you. He sees and he knows and he cares and he is with you. And forgiveness is not endorsing the sin. Forgiveness is not saying that what they did was, was right. Forgiveness does not even mean, although in Joseph's case it did mean a restored relationship, it may not mean a restored relationship. It may not be possible. But what it means is that you are saying, I'm putting this situation in God's hands and I'm choosing to let go of the revenge and the hate and the bitterness that's building up in my heart because God forgave me when I did not deserve it, I will forgive them and I will place this person in God's hands and God will deal with them as he justly sees fit. He'll either bring them to repentance 
and faith in him and forgiveness or they will experience his justice. You can trust your father in heaven. Listen, your father in heaven loves you so perfectly. You're his child. Joseph didn't deny the pain. He didn't endorse the sin. And so forgiveness and grace are the supernatural response to injustice. Number two, forgiveness and grace can end the cycle of hurt and hate. Right? When we choose not to forgive and we choose to respond not how God would have us to do, we, we continue the cycle of revenge and sin. And so grace, treating others the way God has treated us, has the power to break the cycle of sin. Look at what it did for Joseph's family. Right? God, God had plans for Joseph's family. Grace simply chooses to trust God and his plan. And it gives us the power to forgive. Number three, forgiveness and grace position us for God's purposes and plans. God has an amazing purpose for your life. As we talked about for you that were here last week, an amazing possible marked over your life. And forgiveness will allow us to stay on track. It will position us for God's purposes and God's plans. Joseph's story reminds us that we're not the first to experience injustice. We're not the first to experience wrong. And that God knows what he's doing. Listen, God has a purpose in your pain. I, and I told you before, I don't like pain. All right, so we can, all, are we, can we all agree on that? We don't, it's not that we like it, but we step back and say, I believe the sovereign God of the universe who loves me with a love that I cannot fathom or understand has a purpose for what he allows in my life. God had a purpose for Joseph's pain. Right? God had a purpose for those 13 years of injustice and of waiting and of wondering. God had plans not just for Joseph, though. He had plans for Joseph's family to make them a great nation from whom he would one day bring our Savior, Jesus Christ. I can just imagine that, that Jacob had told Joseph some of these stories, probably around a fire at night. Joseph, Joseph, my grandfather, Abraham, he was a great man. And God called him out of his land and he brought him to this land, to Canaan. And God promised that he was going to make him a great nation. My dad, Joseph, well, he was a mess. My dad didn't love me the way he loved my brother, your uncle Esau. But you know what? That didn't stop God's promises. You know, God, the injustices that happen, even inside our families, don't stop God's promises. He said, Joseph, I've, I've made some mistakes too. But God has promised. And I believe all of that allowed Joseph to allow grace to rule his actions. And so I just want to ask you this morning, is there someone that you need to forgive? If you're just really honest this morning, in the hurt and the injustice that you've experienced, is there somebody that you know, I haven't forgiven them. I'm holding it against them. I'm holding it over their head. I, I'm holding what they have done. I, 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 I just haven't been able to forgive them. And if that's you, I want you to know God's brought you to this place so that you might see his good plan for your life. And that is to choose forgiveness. Again, it's not endorsing the sin. It's not saying it wasn't wrong. It's not saying that even justice might should take place in their life, but you're saying, I'm going to release it from my heart into God's hands, and I am not going to carry it around anymore. I'm going to choose to believe that the unseen hand of God is at work in my life and in my circumstances, and I can trust my Heavenly Father by forgiving the one who has hurt me. Joseph saw the unseen hand of God in his life. And listen, if you're God's child, if you know Jesus as your Savior, His unseen hand is at work in your life. He's directing your steps. You know, in Proverbs it says, a man's heart plans his way, but the Lord directs his Even in the injustice, you can trust Him. Forgiveness is not a denial of truth or reality, but a choice to see life from God's viewpoint. And so what Paul wrote to the church is something that God calls us to live out to forgive as we've been forgiven. Here's the thing. God desires that we would be more interested in giving away love than holding on to our hurts. 
right? Because God has so deeply loved you and so been so merciful and gracious to you. He says you can go out now and despite the hurt and despite the injustice and despite what's been done to you, you can live a life that gives away his love and his grace. And listen, our world desperately needs to know of the love of God of the grace of God and the hope that it's only found in Jesus Christ. And when we let go of our hurts and we choose to trust God, we position our lives where God can use our lives to accomplish His purposes, which is to share His love and His grace and His mercy with this world. Is there some hurt you need to let go of? And listen, you're in a perfect place to do that. Because you can do that before God today, but you can talk to your counselor, you can talk to me, right? You, you can let someone guide you through this process. God's brought you here to do this. I believe that God has an amazing plan for your lives. And I just want to leave you with this thought today. You are not what someone else did to you. No matter how evil it was, no matter how wrong it was, no matter how hurtful it was, that's not what defines you. You are what Jesus did for you. That's who you are. Listen, I believe God has incredible plans for your lives and that he wants to use each of you to fulfill the purpose, the story that he's written for you. And I want nothing more for you to be able to trust God. And in order to fill that, fulfill that purpose, I know this, you will have to trust the unseen hand of God because life will not always make sense and we'll not always be able to figure it out. But God has a plan. Would you bow your heads this morning? With no one looking around, I just ask for you to give people privacy for a moment. And I just want you to be honest this morning and say, you know what, I am really struggling with this issue and I, there's someone I need to forgive and I, I haven't been able to do it. Would you raise your hand so I can pray for you? Thank you so much for your courage and your honesty. Here's what I want you to do. Here's what I'm going to ask you to do through the supernatural power of God. Would you ask God right now, just ask him from your heart to his, to say, God, I can't do this. God, would you forgive them through me? Would your power enable me to choose forgiveness? And, and if you need to, talk to your counselor, talk to your, your faculty, talk to me today, find me, I'm available, and, and let us pray with you and walk through this with you. But let God begin to heal your heart by choosing to trust Him. Father, I pray for, for all of us because there's not a single one of us, Father, that will not experience hurt and have experienced hurt. And Father, I pray that when we do, that we would be able to choose to do what you have done for us and that we would be consumed, Father, in our hearts and our minds with how merciful and how gracious you've been to us. And Father, I pray that, that you would give us that supernatural power. Father, I pray for each person that raised their hand this morning. Father, because you know them, you know their heart, you know their hurt. Father, they're your children. And Father, I know that you love them deeply. And Father, I pray that you would not only give them the power to, to forgive, but God, I pray that your healing power would heal their hurts, that you would bind up their wounds, and that your comfort and your peace and your grace would be very real in their life. I pray that they would know deeply that you care about the hurt of their heart. And not only do you care, but you know. Father, I thank you that Jesus sympathizes with our weaknesses and identifies with our hurt and our pain. Father, thank you for such radical love and grace. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.